So there's part of our worship service that we are not using at the moment. After the greeting in our worship service, the greeting was when I said, Sisters and brothers, beloved of God, grace, mercy, and peace be with you all. And you all said, good job, just checking to make sure, all right? After the greeting, one of the things that's often inserted into our service is called the Kyrie. And the Kyrie is a prayer that cries out to God for mercy. The Kyrie is simple. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Sometimes it's used in seasons of the church year that tend to focus on penitential things or how we remind ourselves that we're really sorry for the things that we've done. And I'm going to say the Kyrie again this morning, and you can join me if you'd like. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And I'm crying out for mercy this morning for all of the things that I've done and for all of the ways in which I've upset and harmed people, especially maybe even here in this congregation. But I'm also crying out for mercy for my thoughts this morning because I'm thinking that these are dang hard readings from the Bible. Our lectionary editors or those people that give us a three-year cycle of these readings have put together readings that go together. Yes, they sure do, but they're confusing and they're hard, and I'll admit that I'm struggling with them. We hear our readings from the Bible this morning that talk about justice and about people trampling the poor and buying the needy for a pair of sandals. We hear words that God will never forget any of these deeds. The author of 1 Timothy urges us to offer prayers and thanksgiving and intercessions for those who are in high positions so that they may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and dignity. And in our gospel reading from Luke, Jesus tells another parable about the kingdom of God and about a dishonest manager At least that's what it usually gets called in Bibles. The dishonest manager reduces some of the bills that folks owe his master so that they might look favorably upon him after his manager fires him, or at least threatens to. This is a hard parable. Commentators, those people who get paid the big bucks to think about all of these things and put together something that we can read, they disagree on what it means. And lots of people have tried to explain this parable, but it still remains one of the great mysterious stories of the Bible. And I'm struggling with this parable in our readings because, like parables often do, they point out to us the ways in which we've fallen short Or we've missed that day full of notes that Jesus has given us in class. This morning they also particularly point out our humanity. Sometimes we cheat people. Sometimes we like it when people fail and don't succeed. Sometimes that we forget, as our psalmist said, that God is above all nations, that God's glory is above the heavens. A lot of the time we make God smaller than God is. We make God a friend, an advisor, an absent landlord, anything but our Lord. And when we make God too small, other things become important. If we can't rely on our Lord God with all our heart, soul, and mind, what will we rely on? If God isn't important to us, then neither will our neighbor be too. It will be easy to cheat someone, to exclude them, or to even not honor their existence in the first place. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Enter into all of this Jesus' parable of the dishonest manager that he tells. Jesus says that this, there's a rich man who is a landowner, and like most landowners in the ancient Mediterranean world, he's entrusted his property to a manager or a steward. There are charges brought against the manager to the rich man by the manager's co-workers that he's squandering the rich man's property. The rich man calls the manager in and gives him a judgment, or really what we might consider a pink slip. He can't be the rich man's manager any longer. And so the manager goes on to ask some good questions. What am I going to do now that my master has taken the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. 
His master taking away his job would mean that he has to get another one. But in his training with money and finances, this is going to be a mark against him and his reputation to be hired by another rich man or landowner. So the other thing would be to do some manual labor, work in the fields or something like that. But he's not trained for that. So the only option or work that he would be left with would be to become a beggar. And that's the lowest of low on the totem pole. People don't look highly on beggars, and this manager is a pretty respected person. The manager wants to continue to be a respected person, and so he does what he thinks would be right. He calls in his master's debtors, and he asks them to cut their debt either by 50% or 20%. And it's interesting to me that they have a hand in this. They are the ones who are adjusting the writing on the invoice, not the manager. But this manager is being shrewd, as our reading says. The word shrewd is also translated as prudent or wise, and the rich man even admits this. His shrewdness cheats his master out of some money, but look at what it does for the manager on the flip side. It allows him to be on another level of relationship with the debtors so that when he is finally dismissed, they may welcome him into their homes, possibly give him a meal until he can figure out what to do. The hard part about this parable is that it isn't so far off from our life right now. There are always people who are focused on how the world can serve them without any reciprocation at all and on capital gain. Money in the ancient Mediterranean world was meant to be collected at all times, at all places, and by whatever means possible, often deceitful or forceful if you were on the owing end. The owner and the dishonest manager know this. They often included charges into whatever price you were quoted, both for the owner and the manager. And so my question with this reading is, why does the dishonest manager get commended? Is it because when he's telling other people to slash their bills, he's taking off only his commission and still leaving the profit for the landowner? We don't know that, but we do know that money is power, and both of these men were caught up in that system. Jesus says, No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And that's true. You cannot serve God and wealth. The translation in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which is the one that we previously read before this one in church, the word for wealth reads mammon. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. You can't serve God and mammon. And again, that's true. It isn't that money is bad or that people who have it are bad and people who don't have it are good. That isn't what this is about. The fact is mammon has power and our economic system reminds us of that. The structure of our economic system is based around debt, and not just financial debt, though that is a huge part, but also the debt is ecological in our care for creation and others. And if our job, as Jesus says, is to love God first and then our neighbor, then we also have to ask how we're doing that financially with our money. Are we cheating them? Are we being dishonest to others or withholding something that others may need? Lord, have mercy. Or are we loving others, even with our money and in the midst of unjust structures that are in place? If we serve money as opposed to God, part of us, even if we don't want it to be true, will always be dishonest to our neighbors. We'll always put ourselves first. We'll always take care of us. We confess that as much about ourselves each and every week in our confession and our forgiveness. We confess we're captive to sin and the system of sin and we can't free ourselves on our own. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. But money or mammon doesn't have to become our master. Bishop Satterley, our synod's bishop, is famous for saying the only way not to let mammon or money become our master is to give it away. 
When we give away money to others, it frees us up from the power that money might have. But it also becomes a means of grace to other people and a way of practicing this following Jesus thing in the world. In all of this, Jesus is a master who frees us to be honest about money. And the best way we can do that is to give it away. And so if we were able to be freed up from some of our debts here at peace, particularly, say, the mortgage, what would that mean for us? Well, it might mean that we could be able to give more money away to organizations for their work of helping people, like Samaritas for their work with foster care families or people with disabilities and refugees. It might mean that we would have more money to spend here at home on our efforts with foster care families in Van Buren County. Talk to Kathy Savage about that. We might be able to give money away for the sake of our missionaries, Colin and Jenny, or for our seminarian, Kevin. Maybe it might mean strengthening staff here or adding staff or work with education or outreach. Perhaps maybe even on a personal level, you who are women could join the newly formed Women Who Care group that donates money each quarter of the calendar year to a nonprofit organization that makes a presentation to the group and then they vote on which one to collectively support. Or you could give the money for your recyclables to our youth as they prepare for the 2018 National Youth Gathering so that they could see how connecting with 40,000 other ELCA Lutheran youth means that the church is way larger and bigger than even just here in South Haven. Perhaps you could give to support cancer research or Alzheimer's or MSA or any number of life-altering, chronic, debilitating conditions. You see, being able to give our money away shows that our faith is in God for the sake of another person, for the sake of our neighbors. It's a different way to look at things for sure, but Jesus always encourages us to live into the abundance and the fullness of life. Giving away money to others promotes that abundance in us while helping to sustain another person's life. And in the end, that's the kingdom of God. And that's the kingdom of God come near. Amen.